Good evening, folks. Ken Hovind here and the crew at Dinosaur Adventureland, November 6, 2018. Uh, if you want to come volunteer, we pray, pray for the election today. Pray that they voted out some of the uh, socialists and communists and humanists and morons who believe they should spend everybody else's money for their own pet projects and get a job, earn your own money, guys, okay? The liberals, go find a job. Uh, need a carpenter, a couple of them here, Dinosaur Adventureland, uh, Bible study, 6.30 every night except Saturday. You're welcome to come. Still need a trencher. You got all the trenching done, though, right, that we need now. Long term, we need one of these. If you want to make some concrete or fiberglass dinosaurs, we need a bunch of those around here. And if you want to get involved in the presidential pardon, the Kent Hovind is Innocent.com website should be up soon. But meanwhile, you can call Brady and say, what can I do? All right. Uh, we had two more baptized this week. That makes 35 now so far. Yay, that's why we're here. All right. If you want to join our 777 Club to help us stay open for free, that's what we do, all the activities and all the building. How much do we spend this week on construction? Jeff, Bill? A bunch, yeah, gee whiz, okay. But you, anyway, you can uh, join our 777 Club, go to drdino.com and click the donate button. If you, it's totally voluntary. We don't send out any letters begging for money. If you want to help, help. If not, God will send somebody else. But if you do, make checks to CSE. We've been going through the series of A, B, C, D, E, F, G on this cannot possibly evolve. And uh, resident, outspoken, self-proclaimed atheist, Elson, uh, Aaron Nelson, a.k.a. Aaron Ra, has been uh, on his channel claiming there's lots of evidence for evolution. So I said, would you please send me your best three evidences? And they, they gripe and say, evidences is not plural. There shouldn't be an S on the end. Either word is fine, evidence or evidences. And if you worry about that kind of stuff, you need some serious help. Anyway, most people understand evidences. <clears throat> Where are the three best evidences? Okay. He said his first line of evidence was the fact that evolution happens. Okay, so the best evidence, best evidence for evolution is it happens. And biodiversity and complexity increase naturally. We covered that in the last couple of programs. And I completely disagree with you, Mr. Nelson. Now, in case you don't know, Aaron Nelson is a very well-known sesquipedalian. A sesquipedalian is used to describe someone or something that overuses big words. Like a philosophy professor or a chemistry textbook. <clears throat> if someone gives a sesquipedalian speech, people often assume it was smart, even if they don't really know what it was about, because they can't understand the words. For example, <clears throat> Billy was incapable of producing an anatomical juxtaposition of two orbic, oric, orbi, <laughs> orbicularis oris muscles in a state of contraction due to acute spinopalatine ganglionuretine. <laughs> what? <laughs> well, let's see. The orbiculus oris muscles are these right here. And Spinopalatine ganglioneuritine is an ice cream headache. So why don't you just, just say he couldn't pucker for a kiss because of his ice cream headache, okay? No, no, no. They got to use the biggest words possible to confuse things, and everybody thinks, wow, he's smart, <laughs> okay? I have spent a lifetime avoiding that kind of stuff, okay? Mr. Nelson has spent a lifetime trying to accumulate a large vocabulary of big words. And so we're going to have to go through the word by word slowly and explain his sesquipedalian speech as we go. I'm going to do something very painful tonight. Okay, I'll tell you in just a minute. He is also loquacious. That means verbose. They use lots and lots of words. Talk, 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 talk. A, ses a loquacious sesquipedalian. Talking, loquacious is talking or tending to talk much or freely. Talkative, chattering, babbling. Garulius, a loquacious dinner guest, characterized by excessive talk, wordy, easily the most loquacious person of the play. Meet the master, loquacious sesquipedalian. <laughs> he said, my first fact and evidence in support of evolution, the fact that evolution happens. Aaron, not good, okay? He said, my second fact and evidence in support of evolution is taxonomy. What is that? Let's see. I'm going to play a few minutes, a full, a full minute of his speech. And then I'm going to go back and take it apart piece by piece. Okay? So here goes 
the full minute. Did I get it? Yep. All right. Now to start it, I click here. My second fact in evidence in support of evolution not is showing. taxonomy. There it is. Okay. That was the first indication of evolution and still the most compelling, especially now that it's a twin nested hierarchy, where what had been determined by physical characteristics is now confirmed genetically. Because as the 18th century creationist who discovered it realized, it shows a relationship between all living things that contradicts creationism and that only evolution could eventually account for. Note that cladistic phylogenetic systematics is not drawing lines on paper like you made it out to be. Instead, it's enveloping categories based on diagnostic characteristics because evolution at every level is just a matter of incremental, usually subtle, superficial changes being slowly compiled atop successive tiers of fundamental similarities. And these tiers of similarity establish taxonomic clades. For that reason, evolution adheres to the laws of monophyly and biodiversity. So there can never be a change between kinds and there's no such thing as a kind anyway. Because again, it is a fact that birds are a subset of dinosaurs in the same way that humans are a subset of apes, primates, etherian mammals, and vertebrate deuterostome animals. There's no faith required in any of this. We can prove it all. Now my third. Okay, before we get into his third, <laughs> sesquipedalian. How many agree that was a sesquipedalian speech? Okay, okay. So before we get into, this is why the, some of the commenters are complaining that I cut him off after a few words. We'll say, let him give his answer. Okay, that was the full one minute answer of his second proof for evolution. So I'm gonna go back now and go through line by line and explain if I can figure out how to alt tab right there. Did I get it? Okay. My second fact and evidence in support of evolution is taxonomy. Well, taxonomy is the branch of science concerned with classification. We do that in our shop. We put all the screws in one spot, the nails in one spot, the bolts in one spot, the wrenches in one spot. You classify things and organize them according to what they are. There's no sense having the quarter inch wrench next to the super glue. Okay, it would not make sense. Especially organisms, that is called systematics, getting a system of organizing things, taxonomy. Carolus Linnaeus is famous for his work in taxonomy, the science of identifying, naming, and classifying organisms, plants, bacteria, etc. He was born in 1707. Linnaeus' thoughts on evolution are very different from the modern day theories. He believed that species were immutable, means species can't change. Now he was wrong about this. He's, he would say if there are 30 different kinds of sparrows, then God made 30 different kinds of sparrows. He went overboard in that regard. God might have made two sparrows, and Noah might have had two sparrows on the ark, and they've now diversified to 30 varieties of sparrows, but they're still a sparrow. So he, was, he went overboard in his immutability, okay? Even though, it should be though, Linnaeus believed in immutability, he did believe that the creation of new species was possible, but that it is limited. This is from wickedbooks.org. Now they believe in evolution. <clears throat> okay. So, Carolus Linnaeus was one of the guys in the 1700s responsible for developing what we call today our classification system. He started organizing things in order with kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. So man, for instance, is called Homo sapien. Homo is the genus, sapien is the species. And most animals, they call it a binomial, they give it two names. Instead of just saying it's a sapien, they say Homo sapien, so they give it a, name it after the genus and the species so you know exactly what they're talking about. So that's all Latin. Latin is a dead language. It killed the Romans, and now it's killing us, trying to learn that. <clears throat> but variations in, within species and even creation of new species is possible and has been observed. That is science and is no problem for Bible believers who say that God clearly said they will always bring forth after their kind. Now where exactly is a kind compared to Carolus Linnaeus's classification system? I don't think it's the same spot in every instance, and it doesn't matter. See, God made the kinds before Carolus Linnaeus made his classification system. So God's, def I think the word kind is very descriptive. I think the four different varieties of elephants, African elephant, Asian elephant, a mammoth, and mastodon, are the same kind of animal, and a five-year-old will tell you that. <clears throat> Probably so the kind indicates somewhere around the family or genus level. Everything above that is speculation. If you want to believe 
this proves this, you're crazy. In my humble, totally unbiased opinion. So, Mr. Nelson said, my second fact and support and evidence in support of evolution is taxonomy. That was the first evidence of evolution and is still the most compelling. Whoa. <clears throat> the fact that we can organize animals by their certain characteristics is proof of evolution? I don't understand, Mr. Nelson. Okay, explain that in smaller words, please. So, yeah, it's off screen. <clears throat> Especially now that it is a twin nested hierarchy. That's what he just said. And for you folks that get upset that I cut him off word by word, go back to his speech 2112 to 2223, a minute and 11 seconds. How many? That was rather painful listening to that minute and 11 seconds. Okay. <clears throat> Loquacious sesquipedalian. Okay. He said what had been determined by physical characteristics, in other words, they were classifying them by how they looked or physical characteristics. Could they fly? Did they crawl? You know, whatever. Did they have hair? Is now confirmed genetically. You're dreaming on both counts, Mr. Nelson. He said because as the 18th century creationists who discovered it, they discovered you can classify animals, like people didn't know that before. <laughs> okay. As the 18th century creationists realized, and I'm just quoting word for word what he said, I typed it out, had to listen to it five times, you talk about painful. <sighs> it shows a relationship between all living things that contradicts creationism. Slow down, hold it, stop, beep, pause. How on earth does the fact that we can classify things contradict creationism? He runs off at the mouth and says stuff like this and just bl blows right on by it as if now it's, it's a fact because he said it. This is what college professors do while the student is frantically trying to keep, you know, take notes. And they're just going to have to, well, it must be true, my professor said it. Or it must be true, it's in the book. Slow down. <clears throat> the idea that we can get a relationship between different varieties of animals, life forms, and we can put worms in one category and birds in a different category, that's a fact. That does not contradict creationism. See, the Bible says clearly they will bring forth after their kind. That's all I've ever seen. I think that's all any farmer in the world has ever seen. How many have ever done any farming before? <coughs> we got several here done for the farm. Okay. Do you know of any exceptions to the idea that corn produces corn and cows produce cows and dogs produce dogs? Now, you might get some screwball varieties like the Chihuahua or what you But... <clears throat> It's still a dog, barely, but it is still in the dog kind, okay? <laughs> and that only evolution could eventually account for. This is word for word from his sesquipedalian speech. Mr. Nelson, you are insane. No, Mr. Nelson, the 18th century creationists did not discover a relationship between all living things that contradicts creation and that only evolution could eventually account for. They discovered a relationship and they could classify animals. I think we do that in our cupboard. We're going to put the glasses in one section and the plates in another section and the spoons over here and the forks over here. But don't you know they all evolve from that? Them? That proves they all evolve from the same thing, doesn't it? That's proof for evolution. I never thought of that. Wow. And the, yeah. Okay. He said they began classifying things according to similar characteristics and realized that they all had an amazingly smart creator. That's what, re I did, he didn't say that. That's what they really did in the 1800s. As they classified them, they said, wow, God, you are amazing. You did make them to bring forth after their kind, didn't you? And that's all we've ever seen. Now what happened, gradualism <clears throat> is a widely known theory proposed by Englishman James Hutton. In 1795, he died a couple years after that. <clears throat> that evolution and change occur due to small changes over a period of time. This was also the time of a guy named Jean-Baptiste Lamarck, called Lamarckism. Lamarck, a French biologist, proposed, and it's right here from Wikibooks or whatever this is, Wiki, Wiki University. <clears throat> the French biologist proposed theories of adaptation before Charles Darwin published his theories on evolution. His two theories were use and disuse, and inheritance of acquired traits. We know both of these are not true. In other words, use and disuse. If a bodybuilder works out really hard and builds up huge muscles, like me, uh, <clears throat> is that going to be passed on to his children? 
No, that kid also has to work out and build up his own muscles, right? You, things that you gain by use or disuse, if you stopped using your left arm altogether, just decide, I'm not ever going to use it again. Eventually the muscles would atrophy, it would get weak and it would hang there. Does that mean, will that affect your children? No, because that's genetic. So Lamarck's idea of use and disuse is crazy, it's not true. He said the giraffe got long necks because it kept stretching for the trees. That was Lamarck who thought that up. No, Jean-Baptiste Lamarck. The giraffe has a long neck, not so he can reach the trees, it's so he can reach the ground to get a drink. Have you seen how long his front legs are? Have you seen a giraffe try to get a drink? Spread their legs out, got to bend way down. What if they didn't have a long neck? They would die of thirst. Think about that twice, okay? The long neck is not so you can reach the tree, it's so you can reach the ground. Mm -hmm. Anyway, his other idea was inheritance of acquired traits. In other words, if you acquire something, like you cut your arm off, now your babies will be born with no arm. Which we know is also stupid. Both things he proposed are not true. Both these theories intertwine together. Now, Wiki University just presents this and doesn't tell the people this has all been disproven. Gradualism, the idea made up by James Hutton, that evolution and changes occur due to small changes over a period of time. An example of this theory, stated in Gradualism in the Animal World, is when elephants, due to hard-hit rays of the sun, develop, over a period of time, larger ears. Hold it. <coughs> Does the sun cause the elephant to have larger ears? This is what's being taught today at Wiki University. <clears throat> they become larger in order to help the elephant seek protection or shade from the sun. Guys, they should walk under a tree. Well, James Hutton wrote a book called Theory of the Earth. In that book, in 1795, he said the earth is much older than everybody thinks. Now keep in mind, in the late 1700s, most people thought the Bible was true. Most people thought the earth was about 6,000 years old because that's what the Bible dates add up to. But keep in mind, this was also a time in the late 1700s and early 1800s of many revolutions going on. The American Revolution, 1776. The Polish Revolution, the French, the German, the Spanish. The basic idea of this time period in history was get rid of the king. We're not going to have a monarchy anymore. We want a democracy or some other, anything but a monarchy. Get rid of the king. Well, the Bible says to honor the king. <clears throat> and so they thought the Bible was an obstacle to their political objectives. This textbook says, Before radiometric dating was available, many people had estimated the age of the earth to be only a few thousand years old. But in the 1700s, James Hutton estimated the earth was much older. He used the principle of uniformitarianism. Ooh, big word. Uniform. Always the same. He said processes occurring today are similar to those in the past. Uniformitarianism. The present is the key to the past is what that word means. No, I'm sorry. Uh, the Bible is the only perfect key to the past. But there's a great book dealing with what happened in the early 1800s. This is when it began to change for the whole world. A rejection of the Bible and of the Bible dates, 6,000, in favor of Uniformitarianism, primarily for political reasons. James Hutton's book had a very profound influence on a guy named Charles Lyell. Now, Charles Lyell was a lawyer from Scotland who hated the Bible. Somebody calculated one time that if all the lawyers in the world were laid end to end around the equator, we would all be better off. <clears throat> What's that joke about the difference between a dead possum and a dead lawyer on the highway is the skid marks in front of the possum. <clears throat> One guy said, yeah, 99% of the lawyers give the rest of them a bad name. Uh, anyway, Charles Lyell wrote a book in 1830. Here's his book right there on the shelf, volume 1, 2, and 3, <coughs> Principles of Geology. In his book, you can see his hatred for the Bible kind of leak off every page. He said, men of superior talent, He's talking about himself. <clears throat> Who thought for themselves, in other words, you Christians don't think for yourselves, and we're not blinded by authority, like the Bible. He said, you reach a false conclusion, you have futile reasoning, you believe in ancient doctrine. These are all slams against the Bible. He said, you rest on scriptural authority. He said, you have a religious prejudice. 
Lyle cl clearly and freely admitted his goal was to free the science from Moses. What does that mean? He didn't want people thinking about the strata of the earth and thinking about a flood. He wanted them to see the layers of the earth and think about millions of years. Lyle's the primary guy responsible for giving us what today we call the geologic column. Invented by Charlie Lyle. There's the three books right over there. He's the guy who gave most of the names to the layers, like Jurassic, <clears throat> movie Jurassic Park, Triassic, Permian, Carboniferous, Devonian after Devonshire, England. Most of them have names coming from some area that in France or England. Okay. In the early 1800s, each layer was given a name, and it was given an age, and it was given an index fossil. All this was made up in the 1800s, way before there was carbon dating, potassium argon, rubidium strontium, lead 208, lead 206. None of those had been thought of. So don't tell me this thing was arranged by radiometric dating. It was made up by giving each fossil an age and assuming evolution was true. The whole thing is baloney. Even stacked like baloney. Okay. Uh, it's a fact the earth has layers of rock. The evolutionist will say, well, the layers form slowly over millions of years. The Christian says, no, those layers are from the flood in the days of Noah. And these guys are always trying to erase that line and make you think their interpretation is also part of the fact. No, guys, it's a fact the earth has layers. It is not a fact the layers form slowly over millions of years. Now, you can preach that long and hard, and you do, and you will continue, I'm sure. But that's not a fact, okay? So the geologic column is the Bible for the evolutionist. There's only one place you can actually find it. That's in the textbooks. We've got probably 50 earth science books in here. Look it up. They're in there. <clears throat> geologic column. This guy finally admits it. The blue earth science book, uh, I think it's Holt Reinhardt Winston. No, uh, can't read it. Yeah, Harcourt Brace Jovanovich book. He said, if there were a column of sediments, Unfortunately, no such column exists. Well, at least they're honest. You mean the geologic column doesn't exist? No, it doesn't exist. And they know that. But they teach it in the books like it's a fact. Oh, yes, we went through the you know, Jurassic, Triassic, Permian, Devonian, Mississippian, Silurian. All baloney. If it existed in one place, it'd be 100 miles thick. That's one of the lies I cover in my video number four lies in the textbooks in this series. You can get the whole series for 50 bucks. Uh, get the call 855-BIG-DINO extension 1 and you girls will answer the phone and Anna will say, hi, this is Anna. And Julie will say, <clears throat> hello, this is Julie. And, and you can, is that how it got? <laughs> well, and isn't it the, the deepest they've ever drilled is only like eight miles? So that would be 100 miles thick. Then they, right. Yeah. If, if with all the layers were. Now, this though, this book by Charles Lyell had a very profound influence on Charles Darwin. Don't get the Charlies confused, there's two of them. Charles Lyell wrote the book about the geologic column. Charlie Darwin graduated from Bible college, the only degree he ever got, by the way. His dad was concerned, he was such a lazy bum, he didn't know how to work. He loved to go out and shoot birds. His dad, he wanted him to be a doctor, but he didn't like blood and guts, and so he didn't want to be a doctor. And back in those days, he did not have anesthetic. So when you do surgery on somebody, you get four guys to hold them down while you cut them open and do the surgery. Right. Charlie didn't have the stomach for that, so his dad said, well, I'll get you a job where you don't have to work. You can, I'll get you through college so you can be, work for the Church of England, be an Anglican priest. So he graduated from Bible college, still couldn't find a job. So his dad had some political connections, pulled a few strings, and got one of the ships, HMS Beagle, His Majesty's ship, or whatever they call that, the Beagle, it was going to sail around the world for five years and collect bugs and birds for a museum back in England. So back in those days, the British officers were not allowed to uh, have friends or be friends with the British sailors. Totally different class. Kind of that way today, but not as bad. You military guys know about officers versus enlisted men. So <clears throat> it was worse back then. So they would send somebody with the captain just to have somebody to talk to and play chess with. Was it you telling me that you, your computer beat you at chess, but you beat it at kickboxing? Well, that was you. That was you. Okay, yeah. <laughs> you beat it. The, I like that. Okay, so Charlie Darwin, fresh out of Bible college, took, set sail on the ship for five years, an unpaid job, and he brought with the book that Charles Lyle had just written. 
Lyle later sent him the other two volumes while he was out sailing around for five years collecting bugs and birds. Reverend Henslow had given the book to Darwin and said, don't believe it, but here's the book. Okay. Darwin later read that book and Charlie Lyle's book changed his life forever. Now remember, Darwin had just graduated from Bible college to be a preacher. He's sailing around reading this book about the geologic column and that convinced him to believe, wow, the earth is millions of years old, the Bible's not true. He said, Darwin said in a letter later, disbelief crept over me slowly, at a very slow rate, but at last complete. The rate was so slow I felt no distress. He slowly lost his faith in the Bible. He said, I can indeed hardly see how anyone caught, ought to wish Christianity to be true. For if so, the plain language of the text seems to show that men who do not believe, and that would include my father, brother, and almost all my best friends, will be everlastingly punished. This is a damnable doctrine. So Darwin lost his faith because of Charlie Lyle's book. Darwin tried to dedicate his book to his second edition to Charles Lyle. Dedicated to Charles Lyle from a sincere admirer. Uh, Charlie Darwin. So as Darwin sailed around the, uh, in the, on this boat for five years, they stopped off on these islands right here called the Galapagos Islands. These islands are off the coast of Ecuador, uh, right near the equator. Matter of fact, the equator might run right through them. I think it's just north of them, if I recall, but cl real close. As he sailed around, he shot hundreds of birds. He loved to shoot birds because Charlie loved worms. And he thought it was kind of mean for the bird to eat the worm, so he shot all the birds he could find. And so, did somebody shut that noise off, whoever's doing that, and edit it out? Bill, put, put it, take it outside until you figure it out, okay? Well, okay. No, just, okay. <laughs> All right. As he sailed around, he collected birds on these islands and found there were 14 different varieties of finches on these islands. Some had a big fat beak for cracking hard nuts because that island had hard nuts to crack to eat. Some had a skinny beak because they could eat insects and stuff. Some had real skinny beaks for eating fruit. Now, they were all finches, identical kinds of this, a finch, just different beak thickness, beak shape. Now, the Grants went there a couple years ago and did a study on this and found out during dry years the beak of the finch is one-tenth of a millimeter thicker. During wet years it's a tenth of a millimeter. You know what a tenth of a millimeter is? I think a piece of paper is m more than that. Anyway, so they discovered dry years and wet years influence this. Anyway, Darwin counted 14 varieties of finches and concluded they probably had a common ancestor. I would agree, it was a bird. But then Charlie wrote in his book, which is right over there on that shelf, he said, it's a truly wonderful fact that all, bird, all animals and all plants throughout all history are related to each other. Excuse me, you see 14 kinds of birds and that makes you think birds are related to bananas and whales and elephants? That's the conclusion he reached. Now what happened though, James Hutton influenced Charlie Lyell Charlie Lyle influenced Charlie Darwin, and all three of them guys influenced Aaron Nelson to doubt the Bible. So Aaron said in his diatribe, his sesquipedalian diatribe, note that cladistic phylogenetic systematics is not drawing lines on paper as you made it out to be. Instead, it is envel enveloping categories based on diagnostic characteristics. Okay, well, let's talk about that. <clears throat> Cladistics, a method of classifying of animals and plants according to the proportion of measurable characteristics that they have in common. Would that be reasonable? We would classify animals if they got a certain number of characteristics in common. We would probably not put the pig in with the giraffe. We would put the pig in with the other pigs. We probably would not put the pig in with the birds because they don't have feathers and they can't fly. So I think it's reasonable that cladistics is a method of classifying animals or plants according to characteristics. It is assumed that the higher the proportion of characteristics the two organisms share, the more recently they diverge from a common ancestor. Oh, it is assumed this means a common ancestor. You can't possibly know such a thing. Now, phylogenetic is another big word that he used. 
relating to the evolutionary development and diversification of a species or group of organisms or of a particular feature of an organism. Again, we're back to looking at it and classifying it and deciding we can divide it up into categories based upon characteristics. It's evolutionary development, diversification, they're organizing things. Okay, what about systematics? He used that word in the sentence. That's the branch of biology that deals with classification and nomenclature, taxonomy. He said his second evidence for evolution is taxonomy, the fact that we can organize animals into categories. Okay. Cladistics, a method of classification of animals according to the proportion of measurable characteristics they have in common. It's assumed the more they got, you know, the more recently they diverged from a common ancestor. Phylogenetic, relating to the evolutionary development and diversification of a species or group of organisms or of a particular feature. Okay. And systematics is the branch of biology that deals with classification and nomenclature, meaning how they name them. Nomenclature from naming and taxonomy. Okay. Note that cladistic phylogenetic systematics is not drawing lines on paper as you made it out to be. Yes, Mr. Nelson, I think it is pretty much drawing lines on paper. Instead, it is enveloping categories based on diagnostic characteristics. In other words, we cluster them based upon how we can diagnose their characteristics. Okay, we do that in the shop. We put our wrenches in a pile and our screwdrivers in a pile and our pliers in a different pile. We try our best. We try our best. Okay, it doesn't, <laughs> it does not stay that way very long, but okay. He said because, I'm just quoting verbatim what he said in his, uh, um, what was that word again? Sesquipedalian speech. Okay. <clears throat> Because evolution at every level is just a matter of incremental, usually subtle, superficial changes. Slow down, stop. This is baloney. You got to slice it kind of thin here, okay? It's still baloney no matter how you slice it. But evolution at every level is a matter of incremental, it means very slowly, usually subtle. We don't really see it happening too much. Superficial changes being slowly compiled atop successive tiers of fundamental similarities. In other words, evolution slowly builds up these changes on top of previous changes. This is never observed. This is what you believe. This is why evolutionism is a religion. This is never observed in any type of life form, whether it be bacteria or insects or uh, birds or snakes, it's never observed. You are dreaming, Mr. Nelson. Evolution at every level is not a matter of incremental, usually subtle, superficial changes being slowly compiled atop successive tiers of fundamental similarities. <sighs> Acquired characteristics. <clears throat> a modification or change in an organism, organ or tissue during the lifetime of an organism due to use, disuse, and environmental effects and not inherited. Anything you gain during your lifetime, like bigger muscles or cut off your finger or cut off your hand or something, that's not inherited by the next generation. We know that. That's common sense, you know, freshman biology. <clears throat> inherited traits, according to the, uh, where did I get that? Uh, I just, oh, there it is, sites.google.com. <clears throat> an inherited trait is a feature or characteristic of an organism that has been passed on to it in its genes. Many things are hereditary. Diarrhea is hereditary. That runs in your genes. But lots of things... Right. <laughs> Jeff is looking at me like, what? Uh. <laughs> Never mind. Okay. <laughs> this transmission of parental traits to their offspring always follows certain principles or laws. The study of how inherited traits are passed on is called genetics. I agree. You cannot pass on something you gain. So if you slowly are piling on incremental changes, is this, is this in the genetics? Where are the examples of anything being accumulated in your lifetime that is now passed on? You stated in your first evidence, Mr. Nelson, that acquiring calcium deposits on cartilage is how we slowly change from a cartilage skeleton to a backbone. Isn't that what he said? How is acquiring more cartilage or calcium on your cartilage going to be passed on to the next generation? If you get calcium deposits, I don't think that would get passed on, would it? I'll do my 
Yeah. Has to be in the genetics. I don't think acquiring a calcium deposit is going to be genetic. Evolution at every level is incremental, usually subtle, superficial changes being slowly compiled atop successive tiers of fundamental similarities. I just have to disagree. And these tiers of similarities establish taxonomic, taxonomic clades. And for that reason, evolution adheres to the laws of monophyly and biodiversity. Monophyly. Cladistics, a monophyla, phylo, monophyletic group or clade is a group of organisms that consists of all the descendants of a common ancestor. Oh, so a clade is all the ones that came from a common ancestor. I would be willing to say probably all the dogs came from a dog. So the dogs would be a clade by this definition. Why don't you use the word kind? It's probably very similar here. They don't like the word kind. Uh, they don't like that kind. He says no such thing as a kind anyway. <clears throat> I think there is. I think we are called mankind, if I recall. <laughs> Aren't we? <clears throat> <Okay>. <clears throat> My font is a little too big here. Phylogenetic uh, groups are typically characterized by shared derived characteristics, which distinguish organisms in the clade from other organisms. Oh, so you can tell the bacteria is different than the whale. I thought in the last discussion, uh, whatever you called it, debate, uh, you said the pine tree and the whale were related because they're both eukaryotes. Well, if you can't tell the difference between a pine tree and a whale, <coughs> come, come see me. I'll help you, okay? I'll, I can show you pine trees right out here. We'll go knock on them. Biodiversity. Oh, bio meaning life. Diverse, you know, different. The variety of life in the world or in a particular habitat or ecosystem. There's quite a biodiversity here on dinosaur adventure land property. We've got a bunch of different kinds of trees, a bunch of different kinds of bugs, birds, deer. We've got a lot of animals live here. Okay. So there can never be a change between kinds, and there's no such thing as a kind anyway. Mr. Nelson, if there can never be a change between kinds, how can you say a pine tree and a whale are related? Aren't the, would, you admit, would you admit that they are in a different clade? Are the pine trees in a, do the pine trees have the same ancestor as the whales? You would say yes if you go back far enough, wouldn't you? Yeah. You go back far enough, pine trees and whales are related because they're both eukaryotes. But you said there can never be a change between kinds. Can there be a change between clades? I know you'd rather use that word. And then you said, it is a fact that birds are a subset of dinosaurs. <laughs> Obviously, this is similar to a bird. Who cannot see? Who can't see the difference? There's an article about this, DarwinismRefuted.com. I don't know anything about them, but I enjoyed what I read. Are birds and dinosaurs related? They go through a whole list of things showing, no, they cannot possibly be related for all sorts of reasons. Their heart is completely different. Their lung structure completely different. Their reproductive, don't reptiles, and birds have a hard uh, calcium-covered egg shell. Reptiles have a leathery type of egg. What was, how did it go in the difference there? Don't reptiles have uh, a separate uh, passage for the baby to be born from the uh, uh, urinary tract where birds have all one, just one hole does it all for a bird. That's where they go number one, number two, and have babies, all same place. Go check it out. How did it change, make that transition between that one and the other? Don't whales have a separate hole for breathing than eating, and they can eat and breathe at the same time? They're not connected. From that hole in the top of their head goes to their lungs, and the hole in their mouth goes to their stomach. Birds have one hole in their mouth that have to breathe through and eat through, so how did it make the connection and separate the lungs from the stomach? The esophagus, I mean, explain this with some real science, please. Yes, there are different kinds of animals in the world. He said it's a fact that birds are a subset of dinosaurs in the same way that humans are a subset of apes, primates, eutherian mammals, and vertebrate deuterostome animals. How many have never heard a couple of these words before? 
Eutherian is the placental mammals. The baby has the mother grows, the baby grows inside the mother with a placenta. After the baby is born, the afterbirth has to become out too, called the placenta. Placental mammals are a rather diverse group with nearly 4,000 described species, mostly rodents and bats. So let's see what he said here. Humans are a subset of apes, primates, eutherian mammals. So we are a subset of the same group as the bats and the rats. Maybe he is. Well, maybe he is. Now you got a point there, okay? The placental mammals include diverse forms as whales, elephants, shrews, and armadillos. Obviously, whales and shrews are related. Here we have marsupial mammals versus eutherian mammals. These have a pouch that the baby grows up in. The baby's born just barely developed, like kangaroo babies, possum babies. They're litty bitty. They have to crawl up into the pouch. Who taught them that? They're blind, you know. Soon as they're born, they hang onto the fur and they crawl up into the pouch and latch onto a nipple. For millions of years, none of them could find the pouch. They all died for millions of years. So finally, one of them left a sign up this way to the pouch. And the, the sign had to be in Braille, of course, because they're blind, you know. Their eyes aren't open yet. Okay. Deuterostromia. Stomia. <clears throat> That's a Greek word, which means a second mouth. Deutero means second. Like the second time Moses gave the law is in the book of Deuteronomy. Deutero means twin or second time. Okay. He gave the law first time in Exodus. Forty years later, all them people were dead. Their kids had grown up, so he gave the law again. You can see Deuteronomy has a lot of repeats of Exodus. Who cares? Okay. <clears throat> this includes the phyla of the echinoderms, starfish, sea urchins, chordata, those that have a backbone, and a couple other ones here. Deuterostoma, stomia. Now he will make fun of me for not being able to pronounce these words because I have made a lifetime habit of avoiding this stuff to make it simple for people to, un I want people to understand, not to sit back and marvel, whoa, he knew a big word. That's not my goal, okay? My goal is to make it simple. Okay. Okay. They are classified together on the basis of embryological development. Oh, now slow down just a minute. You're going to put animals in a group depending on how they develop inside the mother. This was proven wrong like in 1874. I couldn't believe this website is still using the embryology pictures proven wrong in 1874. You might want to get my series, Lies in the Textbooks, get the video or the DVD, or the, it's also included in this package for 50 bucks, Lies in the Textbooks. When's the whole new series going to be available, guys? Lies in the Textbooks, 75 Lies, is that, it's on the list? You're going to skip sleeping for four days and get it done. That's what I have to do, brother, okay. You're going to classify them based on how they develop in the embryological stage. He said, it's a fact, birds are a subset of dinosaurs. Mr. Nelson, you need some help. Birds are not related to dinosaurs. Who started this dumb idea? There is no faith required in any of this. We can prove it all. Okay. I would like you to do that, please. Prove to me that birds are related to dinosaurs. Now keep in mind, no fossils will count. Because you can't prove the bones you found in the dirt had any kids. You certainly can't prove they had kids that lived, and you certainly can't prove they had kids that lived that were different, and you can't prove they had kids that lived that were different that were able to produce more babies. I mean, sometimes diverse animals cross, like a lion and a tiger, and they get a liger, and the baby's sterile. They're the dead end. Can't go any further. So you're going to find a bone in the dirt and tell me that's proof that it not only lived and had babies that lived, and had babies that were different from itself, and had babies that were able to reproduce. I think you got four gigantic hurdles here to overcome. No, I think you're completely wrong, Mr. Nelson. There is incredible faith to believe all of this stuff you're spewing. So his second line of evidence for evolution is taxonomy. We can classify the animals. And that proves evolution. Think about that just for a minute. My third line of evidence supporting evolution is that we don't have a mechanism that we know actually works under direct observation and manipulation if we want to 
And we don't just have a phylogeny that we can verify with philosophy. We have a theory. His third line of evidence is they have a theory. We'll talk about that tomorrow night. Thank you for joining us, folks. This is a lot of fun. Uh, I don't think, that, if that's your best three evidences, what game is that where three strikes and you're out? Um, yeah, okay. See you tomorrow night. Press thumbs up, like us, goodbye. I uh, mean, no, subscribe. Uh, share. Ring the bell. Come visit. Bring a hammer. Don't even bring a hammer. We got plenty of hammers. Can you find all the hammers, Bill? We got them all. You got enough hammers? You don't need, they don't need to bring a hammer. They don't need to bring a hammer. Left. We're out of left-handed hammers. Okay, bring a left-handed hammer if you got one. Thank you so much. See you tomorrow. Okay, bye.